Welcome to this third lecture covering Chapter 11 of our textbook. Uh, this topic is capacity and legality. In our first lecture, we covered the topic of capacity. And in our second lecture, we covered the, the first half of the topic of legality. I apologize for cutting a little bit short. Um, uh, something came up and I needed to step away for a moment. So let's continue on uh, the topic of legality. We were, when we were last together, let me, uh, here we go, let's go. We were discussing, this little refresher here. We were discussing the topic of legal object, of course, and we were discussing um, initially, the, during the first half of the presentation, the second presentation, we were talking about when an agreement violates a state or federal statute. And we talked about when it was a crime or a tort. We talked about when it involved unlicensed professionals. And we talked about uh, a usurious contract, and we talked about gambling law violations and Sabbath or blue law violations. Then we switched to talking about public policy violations. And we uh, talked about contracts and restraint of trade. And when we were talking, we were on the covenant not to compete category of uh, uh, contracts and restraint of trade. And we had talked about a salon scenario and also a high-tech scenario. We talked about how customer lists and um, uh, trade secrets could be relevant to um, one of these uh, matters. Um, Interesting thing about this area of the law, when we talk about public policy, you might think to yourself, well, gee whiz, I mean, the public policy that applies in the state of Texas would be the same public policy that would apply in the state of Louisiana or Montana or California or Connecticut or wherever. And so you would expect public policy answers to be very similar from state to state. And you wouldn't be wrong. That's usually the answer. I mean, if it's good for Texans, it's probably we would be good for Minnesotans and Alaskans and Massachusetts, Massachusettsians, whatever. Anyway, um, but this is one area of the law that we don't see that pattern. We see a lot of differences from state to state depending upon the enforceability of covenants not to compete, especially in the employment context. Um, and so actually, but before we dive down this, this pattern, I, I, I apologize. I wanted to finish a story I was talking about earlier. We were talking about ongoing business scenarios. And you may recall when we were last together, Bob had bought my crepery business. Um, and he had opened it the first day of business. And he had lots of, of customers on that first day. There were lots of people who wanted to buy one of Gruber's yummy crepes. And many of these customers had no idea that um, I wasn't behind the crepe maker that day. Um, and if Bob executed the crepes well, they might well continue going to Bob's uh, restaurant, which is still called Gruber's Crepes, um, for a long period of time. After all, Bob was intentionally trying to sell my Goodwill, or excuse me, trying to buy my Goodwill, and I sold it to him. That was the idea. Unfortunately for Bob, though, he did not think to include in our contract a non-compete agreement. So the Monday following uh, him reopening the store um, under his own ownership, I opened my own crepery uh, restaurant in the same strip center where Groover's Crepes are. I open it two storefronts down, and I call this Groover's Better Crepes. And I advertise broadly in the community and tell people, if you want the true Groover crepe, you need to go to Groover's Better Crepes. Um, I have a, a Facebook page, and so I, I tell everybody that I'm opening my business. And um, if you really want the, the true thing, you should come to my store. Well, on that Monday morning when I open, Everybody's lined up at my business. Nobody's at Bob's Crapery. Um, and so as a result, my business continues to flourish, but Bob's business tanks, he loses his shirt, and he eventually has to close down Groover's Crepes because he really didn't successfully buy my Goodwill because I was able to open up a competing sh competitive shop um, in that same strip center and was able to advertise and was able to use a name very similar to my initial name, which caused the goodwill to kind of trickle on over to my business front. And so, yes, Bob bought the pots and the pans and the tables and the cash register, all of that kind of stuff, but he didn't really uh, 
he wasn't able to secure the loyalty of my customers. And so um, under those circumstances, you can see how next time Bob starts a business, he's going to want a non-compete. He's not going to want Groover to be able to open up a competing restaurant in the same shopping center or probably even in the same town. Um, so uh, this, this practice of um, having a non-compete when one is selling a business that the uh, buyer is intending to continue would be um, a very common feature. And it's a less controversial one, frankly, than the employment scenario. So let me go back to what I was saying before. Um, when we're talking about uh, public policy, in this particular area, we see lots of differences. We see some states where um, non-competes are pretty routinely enforceable. Um, the, the courts assume that they're good. I mean, unless there's something shocking about them, they're going to enforce it. Um, so that's one extreme. We'll call that a very pro-employer perspective. And then we have the other perspective, a very pro-employee perspective. And we see that most strongly in the state of California. It is in the state constitution and in state statute that the public policy in the state of California is no non-compete will ever be enforced. Even if the two parties are from a particular state, the same state, and they enter into the agreement in that state, and then one of those parties moves to California. California will still say, even though we had nothing to do the, with the original uh, with the original scenario, um, we still feel like our public policy is in play in that situation, so we're not going to enforce that. Many people think that California's somewhat unusual stance in this area is one of the reasons why uh, Silicon Valley has been so successful. Many times in these high-tech areas, you'll see people flipping jobs from pretty constantly and opening up their own businesses. Um, they wouldn't be able to do that with non-competes, which are so common in the high-tech industry. And so some people have seen that as, as one of the, the reasons why California has been as successful in this industry as it has been. So we have the two extremes. We have the, the situation, we'll say like, uh, we'll just, I'm sorry, here we go. We'll say like Missouri. Missouri is a very pro, um, pro uh, non-compete jurisdiction. And then we'll have California at the other extreme, very anti, the most anti. You can't be more anti than California because they pro prohibit them. Then you have, so you have some states clustered around here. You might have a few states kind of over here. And then you have Texas. I would put Texas probably about here. Texas courts will enforce a well-written, reasonable non-compete, but it won't enforce many that would be enforceable in Missouri. And so, um, uh, in fact, Texas has been moving. Uh, if we were 10 years ago, if we say this, well, let's do it more in 10 years. Let's say we were in 2000. I probably would have put Texas about here. Yes, we had a statute that in theory allowed non-competes in the employment context. It's just that our Texas Supreme Court had never found one that satisfied the standard that this legislature had developed. And so it was it theoretically possible, but they were always saying, no, no, it, it fails in this area. No, it fails in this area. But since that time, there have been several important Texas Supreme Court cases that have moved the line. They're now finding that some of these non-competes do comply with the statute, even though the statute itself has not changed. And so now um, it is uh, believable to think that there can be non-competes in Texas that are enforceable. Let's uh, think about uh, what makes a non-compete reasonable. What makes a Texas uh, court likely to enforce it. And by the way, before we go too far down this path, let me pause and say, um, if you are an employee who is put in a position um, of deciding whether to sign a non-compete or not, keep in mind in Texas that there is no impediment to the employer saying you have to sign this in order to maintain your employment. That's a very common uh, statement that an employer will make and it's perfectly lawful in Texas. So if you say no, say no, uh, please understand that you are likely not to be able to continue with your employment in that particular location. Other states don't necessarily permit quite that clear of a, of a choice being made. 
um, as you move from state to state in your career, you will see the laws vary. Um, so the state that you are in at the time that you sign the non-compete can be important, and the state that you're choosing to move to can be important. This is a very uh, complex um, issue to, to think about, um, both from the perspective of the employer and the employee. Another issue that comes up in this area sometimes that's important to consider is the fact that let's say that I enter into a non-compete with my employer and it's just clearly not enforceable. I mean, there's all kinds of legal problems with it. Maybe that's even one of the reasons why I sign the, the non-compete because I recognize it's, it's garbage. It's not going to be enforced by a Texas court. Anyway, um, I uh, leave my employer and go to work for a competitor. Um, and, and I'm violating the terms of the non-compete, but after all, it's not enforceable, so what do I care? Um, then my former employer calls my new employer and says, hey, new employer, are you aware of Groover's non-compete? New employer goes, no, tell us about it. And so the old employer gives a copy to the new employer. The new employer reads it, and it goes to the legal department. Legal department reads and goes, yeah, you're right, Groover, this is not enforceable. But guess what? We don't want to have to spend legal legal money or money on legal bills in this situation because even though it's not enforceable it's not going to stop the old employer from suing us and these lawsuits are very very expensive it's very easy to drop a hundred thousand dollars really fast in these cases so you're just not worth it so goodbye we're firing you and you can see that even a non-enforceable non-compete can result in me not being employable so let's say I did things a little differently. This time, when I was interviewing at this new employer, before I'd accepted the job, I told the new employer about the non-compete. I even showed it to them. They looked at it, they go, okay, yeah, you're right. This is, doesn't seem to be enforceable under the current understanding of Texas law, but we're not going to touch you. We're not going to touch this case because um, it's too risky. We don't want to spend the legal bills. So we consider you not somebody we're willing to, to hire. So even an unenforceable non-compete can significantly restrict the employability of a person. Okay, so let's go back to um, the, the factors that result in a covenant not to compete being reasonable. One issue can be... Um, one issue can be um, the uh, uh, reasonableness of both the time period that is covered by the non-compete and the geographic area. Let's go back to our salon scenario. Um, let's face it, most people get their hair cut every few weeks. Maybe a person might wait uh, six or eight weeks, maybe even 12 weeks, but people don't go years between haircuts. So as a result, if I have a non-compete, or, or let's say I have a customer and um, I'm not able to cut their hair for six months. Well, during that time, that customer is almost certain going to get his or her hair cut by somebody. And uh, presumably, if I'm unavailable for a lengthy period of time, they're going to develop a relationship with this new person. And quite possibly, they're going to be happy with that relationship. So a break of even a few weeks or even months is going to significantly uh, erode that relationship that I have with my um, customer. But let's assume we're in a different business. This time we're in the business of, of selling tractors. Maybe I work for John Deere. Maybe I work for Peterbilt. But whatever it is, that's my job. Well, let's face it. Farmers aren't buying a new tractor every few weeks. They probably only buy a new tractor every few years. And so if I am not available to um, uh, sell somebody a tractor for several months, yeah, I might lose a few of my uh, clients, but the majority aren't going to have had a need to buy a tractor during that period of time. So you can see how a particular industry could affect how long the non-compete needs to be. And that is a factor. So there isn't a magic number of years or months that a non-compete is going to stay into in force. It's going to depend upon the particular industry. Salons, uh, that, it, that period of time is going to be shorter than if you were a tractor seller. Generally, though, probably about a two-year period is generally considered pretty reasonable in, in many industries. So it needs to be reasonable in terms of the time period, but also needs to be reasonable in terms of geography. Um, 
going back to my salons scenario, um, people don't travel across country to get their hair cut. Most people are probably not going to be willing to travel more than 25 miles. So if I have a, in my non-compete a restriction that says I can't cut hair anywhere in the United States, that would be overbroad. Because if I were to say, let's say I work for a salon in Allen, Texas, and it says I can't work for, and this is not a, a, a chain, this is just a single freestanding salon. And it says I can't work for any other salon for two years in the United States. That means I can't move to Alaska and cut hair. Well, it's just not believable that my following, the customers that I have in Allen, would travel all the way to Alaska for me to cut their hair. That's not believable. So under those circumstances, that would be way broader than it needed to be. If we're looking at a position in which the individual is involved in sales, many times the reasonable geographic area will be the boundaries of that particular person's sales territory. Of course, a person might move sales territory over time, so it might be bigger than their sales territory now, reflecting the, the, the land that they used to have. So imagine that when I sell tractors, I'm responsible for uh, North Texas, uh, Southern uh, Oklahoma, and we'll say uh, Western Louisiana. Well, that would be my territory. That would be a reasonable scope for my non-compete to include. So if Peter, if I work for John Deere and Peterbilt wants to hire me to sell tractors in California, it, or not, we'll not say California because that's a bad example, but we'll say in uh, Nebraska. Let's assume Nebraska has a, a pretty uh, willingness to in, enforce non-competes. Very likely the court would say, eh, there's no possibility that your customer list from your time in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana will help you in Nebraska. And so the court might well say that, that uh, the, the geographic restriction should not be so broad. So we can see it needs to be reasonable in terms of time and geographically. It also needs to be reasonable in scope. So imagine that, uh, again, I'm a hairstylist. I mean, it would be reasonable to limit me in terms of performing hairstyling and barbery services. Uh, barbershop services. It might also be reasonable to restrict me from um, nail tech services. It would not be reasonable though to say that I can't work in any, um, I will say, in any uh, retail business. So I couldn't sell clothes or I couldn't um, uh, sell groceries because it wouldn't be reasonable to think that uh, somehow or another the person to whom I have cut the hair is going to follow me to this to this store where I'm now selling clothes and even if I the, the customer did follow me how would that hurt the business of the salon where I used to work because the salon where I used to work doesn't sell clothes so it usually has to be a fit with the particular job res responsibilities that I have now there's a reason there can be reasonable disagreement as to how broad or how narrow the scopes of that particular item might be um, here is the statute that we have in Texas. I'm going to just flip on over so you can see the statute that that we have here. So going back to this, we're going to go to the Business and Commerce Code, and we're going to go to Chapter 15. Here we have the provisions for the non-compete. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is where you find it. It is, as I said before, a statutory thing in Texas. Um, the statute is designed to uh, provide what the uh, uh, public policy is in the state of Texas. As I noted before, this is a rapidly changing area in Texas law. Um, the case law is pretty complex. The statute itself isn't that helpful because what the Texas Supreme Court did in terms of interpreting it has sometimes been a little bit surprising. So you need to not just look at the statute, but also consider the case law. Okay, so now we're gonna consider another area of public policy concerns. Let me just go back and go over our list that here that we have. So we're talking about public policy. We've discussed contracts and restraint of trade. 
and now we're going to discuss unconscionable contracts. Now, we're going to talk about this idea when we're talking about the reality of assent. That's in a different chapter. I believe it's chapter 12, but we'll be covering that soon. So there's a couple of different ways of getting at the idea of unconscionability. But we're going to approach this from the perspective of public policy because I think that's a sensible one, and it's what our textbook does. So what does the term unconscionable mean? Well, we can see in the middle of this word we have the word conscience. And we all know what a conscience is. It's what tells us right from wrong. It's what uh, makes us experience a guilt or shame when we do something uh, uh, guilty or shameful. Um, if I uh, steal something, I'm going to feel uh, shame with respect to that. If I tell a lie, I'm going to experience guilt because of that. That's our conscience working. So an unconscionable contract is a con contract that violates our conscience, that makes us feel bad, that seems really, really deeply unfair, that seems shameful. Let's look at the definition here. An something that is unconscionable is a contract term in which one party has so much more bargaining power than the other party that the powerful party dictates the terms of the agreement and eliminates the other party's free will. In other words, it's really, really unfair. It shocks the conscience. It is uh, very uh, deeply disturbing. Uh, the common law prohibits unconscionable contracts, but also the Uniform Commercial Code uh, also prohibits unconscionable contracts. You don't need to know the specific section of the UCC, but you can see it's in Article 2, where the, the sales uh, contracts section. There are two ways that we can look at unconscionable contracts. One is we can look at procedural unconscionability, and we can also look at substantive unconscionability. Okay, let's look at first procedural unconscionability. This happens when there is a procedure associated with the contract that, be, um, without looking at the substance, just the way the contract is pre presented is deeply unfair. Imagine that I uh, imagine that you uh, only know how to read and and speak English. I put a contract in front of you that is written in Serbo-Croatian. Um, you look at it um, and you don't know any of the words. You have no idea what it says. You say, uh, uh, okay, "Do you have this in English?" Nope. Only have it for you in Serbo-Croatian. Uh, can I hire a translator? Nope, you sure can't. Uh, can I think about this for a while? Nope, you need to make your decision right now. Either sign it or don't sign it. That would be procedurally unconscionable because I haven't given you an opportunity to even understand what you're committing to. Now, obviously, that situation is pretty extreme. <coughs> but we can see um, kind of a smaller examples of that. A, a contract that is written in very legalistic terminology, legalese, um, where lots of legal terms are thrown around, maybe Latin expressions are present, and the person who is being asked to enter into the contract is a lay person, maybe a person who only has a high school uh, a degree. And so this person really lacks the understanding of the law, this vocabulary, this terminology to even make sense of what it requires. Well, for him or her, that would be a procedurally unconscionable contract. An example of a category of contracts that um, can be unconscionable are adhesion contracts. I use the word can very carefully, though, because most adhesion contracts are perfectly lawful. In fact, it's pretty rare that one is held to be unconscionable. But the fact that it is an adhesion contract is one fact that pushes it more towards unconscionability than it otherwise might be. So what is an adhesion contract? This is a contract that one party, one of the two parties, creates the contract and that was refuses to negotiate over. He goes, listen, either sign it or don't, your decision, but you can't make any changes to it. I'm not going to negotiate with you over paragraph 47 or 92 or anything like that. Uh, that's an adhesion contract. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, gosh, I've entered into lots of those contracts. When I signed the lease on my apartment, I wasn't able to change any of the terms. Uh, when I signed my cell phone agreement, I couldn't negotiate over that. Uh, when I uh, clicked on that click wrap agreement on my computer, I didn't get the option to say, well, let's negotiate over this clause. And you're right. You and I all the time enter into adhesion contracts. 
Of course, in the vast, vast majority of those cases, uh, those contracts have been lawyered up to a very, very high extent. Uh, the legal staff of that company has thought about this from every angle to make sure that even though it's an adhesion contract, the courts are very likely to hold it to be procedurally not unconscionable. But it is a factor to consider, and it can be, especially when other factors are present, can be a basis for having it found to be unconscionable. Let's think about substantive unconscionability. This is probably more what we think about when we think about unconscionability. This is when it's act, we're actually looking at the substance of the contract itself, the actual terms, the nitty gritty. Um, how much money am I going to have to pay to get what kind of service? Um, those types of things. And we talked before about how the court doesn't want to be a nanny. The court is not going to be there saying, gosh, Bob, you didn't negotiate a very good deal. Uh, we're going to help you out. We're going to renegotiate it for you. No. The court's going to say, Bob, guess what? You did a bad job negotiating, and this is the penalty. You're stuck with a bad deal. Next time, man up. Do a better job. Learn from this experience. I'm not your mommy. I'm not your nanny. You know, you're an adult. You need to do a better job. Don't ask me to fix your problems. But when it's really, 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 really shockingly unfair, um, the courts may step in. A lot of times courts will, do, courts will do this, especially when one of the parties to the contract isn't in a weak position. They might be elderly, they might be disabled, they might be um, unsophisticated, they might have been in a particularly vulnerable circumstance. Maybe they've just lost their spouse or they've just lost their job and so um, they're, they're having some difficulty in their life circumstances. Um, and so you should never count, you should never enter a contract thinking, well, you know, if I don't like this, I can always ask the court to find this unconscionable. And that's a, a long shot argument to make and probably won't be successful. So we've talked about uh, covenants not to compete. We've talked about unconscionable contracts, and now we're going to talk about exculpatory clauses. Exculpatory by clauses, by the way, can be a type of unconscionability. So it kind of falls under that larger umbrella. So what is an exculpatory clause in a contract? By the way, a co whole contract wouldn't be exculpatory. It'd be just a particular clause in a contract. These clauses aren't unusual really. They're, they're quite common and so just because a contract has an exculpatory clause does not mean it's unconscionable or even that that particular clause is unconscionable. And again it's like the adhesion contracts. It's one factor that might cause the court to consider finding it unconscionable. So when we say exculpatory, uh, what does that mean? Well, let's think about this. If you've ever watched, say, a, a television show like Law and Order or some other uh, police procedural show, you may have heard the term ev exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory evidence is evidence that tends to show that this person didn't commit the crime. For example, in a Law and Order episode, an example of exculpatory evidence might be my alibi. I had uh, a rabbi and a mom and a priest all... Um, present with me or willing to testify that I was with them at, at the restaurant at the time that I was supposedly killing Bob. Well, that would be exculpatory evidence because it would tend to indicate I'm not guilty. Inculpatory evidence would be the reverse. My handprints on the murder weapon, the email threats that I sent to Bob, those would be inculpatory evidence. But we are, with the word exculpatory, focusing on the evidence that tends to make me less guilty. So when we're talking about an exculpatory clause in a contract, we're talking about a clause in a contract that makes me less responsible, less culpable. If uh, you grew up in a Christian tradition, you may have heard the term mea culpa. Or maybe if you weren't, you grew up in a Christian tradition. Mea culpa is Latin for my fault. And traditionally, this was an expression that Christians used when they were confessing sins. My fault, my fault, my maximum fault. Um, and so you can see here, exculpatory, X means out of, out of fault. So a clause that removes the fault that that person has. In other words, removes the liability that that person has. So imagine I have a, um, a dry cleaning establishment. Um, uh, Teresa comes into my dry cleaning establishment and she has her 
heirloom wedding dress here. She's about to get married and this wedding dress has been passed down in her family for several generations. It's a very expensive Belgian lace. It's just beautiful. It's in mint condition. Um, it's just a lovely, lovely dress. If you were to try to buy a dress like this today, it would be several thousand dollars given the, the intricacies of, of all of the, the lace. Anyway, she would like for me to clean it and do a few minor repairs and also alter it to, fig, to, fix, to fit her figure. And I, I not only do dry cleaning, but I also do alterations. So I say, that sounds good. I look it over. We identify the few places that there might need to be some fixes. And um, I explain that this service, uh, because of the delicacy of the lace, is going to cost $500. Um, uh, Teresa says, that's fine. I was expecting to pay that amount of money. Um, but I expect for that $5,000 that the dress will be cleaned, um, that these, these little... Uh, few strings will, will need to be patched and that you will alter it so it fits my figure. I said, yes, all of that will happen. Okay, so we sign a contract to that effect. I uh, take Teresa's measurements and I um, go, go ahead and accept her $500. She's supposed to come back in a week. In a week, uh, she comes back. She says, hi, I'm here. I'm getting married in a week. In, in a week or from, from today, so I'm really excited to see the dress. And I say, well, um, let me go find it. So I go get the dress, um, I unpackage it, and unfortunately, there is a huge black stain on the dress. Not sure how it got there. In addition, there are several spots where the lace has been torn. It's pretty obvious that the dress is destroyed. There's just no way you'd be able to uh, fix all of this, uh, these injuries or remove the dye. I guess you could dye the dress black, but um, just doesn't, it's, it doesn't look recoverable and no one's going to get married in a black wedding dress. So um, Teresa's in tears. She's devastated by this. And so she says, um, well, um, I'm going to sue you for all that you that you're worth. This dress was appraised for five thousand dollars. My wedding, I have planned to spend thirty thousand dollars on it, and um, it's too late for me to buy another wedding dress. The wedding's in a week. Uh, there's no way that I'd be able to get fitted and everything done for the for the uh, wedding before that date. So you owe, you're going to owe me a lot of money. And I say, oh well, Teresa, I'm I'm very sorry that your dress. Uh, uh, is messed up. I, I acknowledge that, that it is destroyed. But remember what the contract said. And Teresa looks at me, she goes, well, what do you mean what the contract said? It said I needed to pay you $500 and you were going to do all this awesome stuff for my dress and you didn't do it. So therefore you owe me my $500 back and a lot of other stuff. I said, oh, you must not have read paragraph 417. Teresa's looking at me like, well, what do you mean? And so I get out the contract, which is, you know, 100 pages long, and I flip to page 417. I say, look here, Teresa, it has an exculpatory clause. It says if anything happens to the item that you're submitting for dry cleaning, um, you can successfully sue me for no more than $10. What? That's crazy. I would never have left this item here if I had thought that was a condition. I go, yeah, I can see how you might not, but you did. You didn't read the contract. I mean, that's your fault. That's not mine. And so um, I am willing to refund $10 of that $500 to you. We can call it even then. I'll keep the $490 and you can have your dress that is now in tatters. That's an example of an exculpatory clause. Uh, most courts would say that that would be unconscionable. Uh, when I'm being paid $500 to have an exculpatory clause, that's $10. It uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure, let's say the exculpatory clause had said in effect that my limit of liability would be however much uh, Teresa paid me, the $500 in this case. That probably would be reasonable because it wouldn't make sense um, for me to have to pay for Teresa's whole wedding because after all, if I were to pay, say, the $30,000 for Teresa's wedding, imagine how much more I would have to try pay for dry cleaning. Um, and, and obviously, I would have to pass that on to other clients. So instead of the next person who came in for, my, for uh, getting his, her wedding dress uh, fixed, it would now be $1,500, not $500. And so exculpatory clauses that seem reasonable are likely to be enforced.
So the basic test is whether an exculpatory clause is unenforceable, see if the enforcing party engages in a business practice directly related to the public interest. So usually exculpatory clauses are going to be limited when it deals with things like banking, transportation providers, and public utilities. Um, obviously, dry cleaners don't fall into that category, but there still is a possibility that an exculpatory clause could be found to be um, um, unconscionable. If it were found to be unconscionable, the court could rewrite it to raise the amount to a higher level, or the uh, court could just um, remove that whole clause and eliminate the exculpatory clause completely. Or I suppose the court could throw out the entire contract. So the court has several options um, as it sits in equity to decide what to do under those circumstances. So we've talked about contracts that violate state or federal statutes. We've also discussed agreements that violate public policy. And of course, in both cases, better to call them agreements than contracts because they really aren't contracts because they're missing that requirement, that fourth element, a legal object. So throughout this discussion, we've been talking about contracts um, or excuse me, agreements that aren't really contracts because they lack a legal object. And we've mainly been assuming for the most part, although there have been a few times where we've talked about a different approach, but that these contracts would be null and void. They would be void contracts. And the, the legal reason for that, the name for that reason is impari delicto. Um, and that means at inequal fault. That's a legal term. Um, the assumption in the law usually is that when people enter into an illegal contract, they're both to blame. They're both guilty. Let's go back over the theories that we've talked about and see if we think that the parties to these various contracts were impari delicto. If they were, the court's likely to find the contract void. If they weren't, the court is likely not to. So starting with a contract to commit a crime, clearly impari delicto. A contract to commit a tort, clearly impari delicto. So in these cases, the contract would clearly be void. Contracts with non-licensed professional. This is going to depend, but probably more likely than not, the non-licensed professional isn't going to be able to enforce the contract, but the victim of the professional will be able to enforce the contract. And sometimes even the non-licensed professional, for example, my fishing guide, might be able to enforce the contract, especially when the license requirement wasn't for public safety or something like that, but was a means for the state to raise revenue. Usury. Again, these types of contracts are going to be void for the um, lender. but the borrower is actually a victim of these contracts, so he isn't impari delicto. Gambling laws, this is going to be void. The parties are gonna be impari delicto. Sabbath laws, though, probably not. Um, probably uh, just the business that stayed open in violation law, and even there, I'm not sure that the courts wouldn't go ahead and enforce the contract. Um, even if the vendor or the car dealership or the liquor store in this case violated the rule. Uh, contracts and restraint of trade, again, usually these are going to be void. Um, the courts uh, uh, will be, be finding them void really to advance the interests of the employee uh, because they are against his or her interest. He's kind of a victim or she's kind of an interest of this unfair contract. The employee is usually not considered impari delicto in most cases, um, but to enforce the contract would be to the disadvantage of that employee. And then we have unconscionable contracts. Again, this is not an example of impari delicto, but those contracts would be void because the person who is the bully in the situation um, uh, should not benefit from the um, unfair contract. And then exculpatory clause, that clause would be struck from the contract. That would be void. So let's talk about a scenario in which 
impari delicto doesn't exist. And the case that I like to look at for this one is um, Liebman versus Rosenthal. Um, this is a story from World War II. Uh, Mr. Liebman and Mr. Rosenthal are both people of the Jewish faith, and they were living in Europe at the time. I forget which is which. I may be flipping the names, but in my story, uh, Liebman is the good guy and Rosenthal is a bad guy. And I apologize if I'm getting this order incorrect. Mr. Liebman um, was uh, living in Europe and he and his family were trying to escape the Nazis. As I'm sure you know, uh, during World War II, uh, the Germans uh, killed many people of the Jewish faith. Um, and so Mr. Liebman was aware that his and his family's life were in great danger. So he took everything that the family had um, the jewelry, the cash, the, the other items of value that he had. And they, he traveled westward across Europe, kind of staying one step ahead of the Nazis, knowing that if the Nazis caught up with him, they would um, take him probably to a concentration camp and he and his family would be killed. Mr. Lehman somehow makes it to Portugal and he uh, finds Mr. Rosenthal. While Mr. Rosenthal is also of the Jewish faith, um, he uh, uh, isn't a good guy in the story. Um, he uh, says to Mr. Lehman, Lehman, you can't get out of Europe. Uh, you don't have the right papers. Nobody is going to let you flee. Um, so the only way that we can get you out is if we forge the documents that are going to get you out of the country. And in order to do this, I'm going to need some money from you. I'm, I'm going to have to bribe some people to get the right forms. And so I'm going to need a lot of money from you in order for this to be accomplished. Well, um, essentially what this was was uh, forgery and uh, bribery. Obviously, those are two crimes. And so Mr. Liebman agreed to this scenario. So he was agreeing to illegal behavior. Mr. Rosenthal takes Mr. Liebman's money, um, all, of the, all of the things that Mr. Liebman has, and he leaves with the money, and he does not give Mr. Liebman any of the documentation that Mr. Liebman was seeking. So now poor Mr. Liebman is in Portugal with no money and no way to get out. But somehow or another he does. I don't know that part of the story, but somehow or another he is able to escape the Nazis, and he and his family gets to New York City. And now the war has concluded, and he's walking down the street, a street in New York City, and he sees Mr. Rosenthal. He's flabbergasted. He had assumed that Mr. Rosenthal was still in Europe. Perhaps he had been killed by the Nazis. Um, and so he confronts Mr. Rosenthal and says, Rosenthal, you owe me that money. You took that money from me that was for my family, and you did not give me the documentation. Mr. Rosenthal said, well, Mr. Lehman, you're right. You did give me the money, and I didn't give you the documents that I promised. I breached our agreement, but our agreement was unlawful. It was for an illegal purpose, and so, therefore, it was not an enforceable contract. I don't have to return my money to you. Well, Mr. Lehman agreed, and he sued Mr. Rosenthal in court, and uh, uh, Mr. Lehman was successful. The court said, yes, that type of contract traditionally would be in a situation of impari delicto. Both parties are agreeing to violate the law. But when one considers that the Liebman's lives were hanging in the balance and that there was no meaningful legal system that would protect them, um, we do what we have to do to survive. And so um, it's not fair to say Mr. Liebman was impari delicto with Rosenthal. Therefore, Mr. Rosenthal needs to return the money. So there are situations like when I go to the doctor who really isn't a licensed physician where um, an illegal contract can be enforceable because of a lack of impari delicto in one party's hands. And I have the, the dirty hands here to reflect the fact that um, this means that neither party has clean hands. Both of them have some responsibility. We wouldn't say that in Mr. Lehman, he was just doing what he had to under difficult circumstances but we would say that of Mr. Rosenthal. Okay, so when the parties are not impari delicto, 
Um, this arises when a member of a protected class is involved in the agreement that contradicts the statute. Again, that's a situation where I go to a doctor thinking he's a doctor, but he's really not. I'm protected in that situation. There can also be a situation where there's justifiable ignorance of facts. Now, it's never okay to be ignorant of the law. I know that's kind of a silly idea that we all know the law perfectly. Not even um, attorneys know the law perfectly, but the idea exists that somehow or another we ought to know the law perfectly. Um, and so we, uh, we, we put that obligation on us, even though it's not reasonable. Um, but we can be ignorant of facts. So let's imagine uh, this scenario. Uh, we'll go back to the situation in which I um, uh, had that, uh, I'm back in my state where I attended college. I'm still 18 years old. I enter into a contract with the beer distributor to drop off that keg for a period of 12 months every Friday. Uh, but when I enter into the contract with the beer distributor, the beer distributor asks for a driver's license from me. I actually have a fake ID. Um, the state that I originally came from, uh, you had to be 18, excuse me, 21 to drink alcohol, so I had this fake ID. And it's a very, very believable fake ID. I mean, it was very professionally done. They look at it, they say, okay, this looks legitimate, they make a copy of it, they have in their records that in fact I am 21. Well, I'm really 18, but they don't know that. Um, it's not important that I be 21 yet because the law in this state is 18, so they really don't even think too much about it. After all, there would be no need for me to have a fake ID that says I'm 21. All I need to be right now is 18. Well, again, the legislature comes into session. They pass this law raising the drinking age to 21 while we're in that 12-month contract. Um, uh, what the, the beer distributor should have done is stop delivering the beer to me. And that's what it would have done if it had known I was really 18. But my fake ID was so credible that they assumed, hey, Gruber's 21. This change in the law doesn't affect her. We can continue to deliver the beer. In that situation, I'm clearly uh, at fault. I knew that I was giving a fake ID. I knew that I was not supposed to continue to get the beer um, after the law changed and I was still 18. But the beer distributor, we could say, had a justifiable ignorance of that fact. So we could say that it is not impari delicto. In that situation, let's say that it continues to deliver the bills, but I stop paying for it. And because of the, their billing cycle, they actually deliver some kegs before they realize I'm not going to be paying anymore. So they want to sue me for it. Well, at that moment when they sue me, I say to them, ah, no, you can't sue me successfully because we're in pari delicto. This is an illegal contract once the law changed in the state. And we're both at fault because you aren't supposed to sell beer to people under the age of 18, which is under the age of 21, which is what I am. And so therefore you can't successfully collect this money. Well, the beer distributor would say, ah, but we're, I'm not really in pari delicto because I had a justifiable ignorance of the facts. And who knows how the court would rule, but the, the, the beer distributor would have a reasonable chance under these circumstances. Okay, then there's one scenario that we haven't talked about yet, and that is when one of the parties withdraws from an illegal agreement, they have a, 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 a moment of conscience. They decide they don't want to participate in that anymore. They decide to get out of the deal. In that situation, as long as they withdraw before any illegality has occurred, then the courts will say they are not impari delicto. Imagine that you and I are planning on robbing a bank. Um, we have um, uh, taken steps to kind of plan out. We've cased the bank. We've decided a strategy as to how we're going to do this. And um, you happen to have more money than me, so you have uh, given me some money to go out and buy a car that we will use as our escape vehicle. And in fact, you've given me $10,000 to accomplish this. And I've gone out and I bought the car. Well, as you think more and more about it, you decide that no, you don't want to participate in robbing a bank. You want out of this deal and you want your money back. Um, and uh, so you sue me saying, hey, look at this contract we had to rob a bank. Um, I backed out of it before we did anything illegal. I mean, we didn't rob the bank. All we did was plan it, which isn't necessarily illegal. And uh, we bought a car. And so I ought to be able to get my money back from my co-conspirator 
Um, and but my response is, wait a second, it's illegal to rob a bank, so our contract is illegal. We're in pari delicto, so I ought to be able to keep the car and not pay you anything for it. Well, under this circumstance, I'm probably going to lose because you backed out before we did any illegality. And so the court would likely to say that you're not in pari delicto from me with respect to the transaction. Okay, so let's talk about what the court's going to do with an illegal contract. Gordon, we've talked about circumstances in which the court declares the whole thing null and void or maybe is able to save certain parts of that. And it really turns on whether the contract itself is considered severable or indivisible. And severable, as you can see here, it means able to be severed or cut apart. See here, we have the scissors, we're cutting something up, we're uh, cutting and pasting. So for example, we, if a contract, let's say a contract that is severable, might have an exculpatory clause. Well, we could just cut that out and the rest of the document can continue as it otherwise would. Or imagine we have a usurious contract. And so we might cut out the parts of that contract that are usurious, but keep the other parts. Um, the way to think about a severable contract is that these are actually several different contracts all in one. Going back to the beer, uh, beer distributor contract, you could look upon each one of those scheduled deliveries. If it was for a year, it'd be 52 deliveries as 52 separate contracts. And so the court could keep, could not sever the ones that happened up until the legislative change and then sever out the ones that happened after that. So some contracts are severable, and again, it all turns upon the language in the contract, but some contracts are indivisible. It doesn't make sense to carve it up. Um, if you cut one part out, you really don't have an, a, an agreement anymore. It doesn't really turn on how long or how short the, the contract is. It really turns upon the substance of the contract. These contracts are all or nothing. So if one portion is, is, is uh, violating the law, the whole contract is going to fail. And again, there's an active debate in the litigation about which category a particular contract is going to fall into. Well, this concludes our lecture uh, for Chapter 11. I hope that this information has been helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions about either capacity or actually before we, oh, sorry about that. Oh, uh, let me, before we do that, let's go back, excuse me. Uh, let's go back to our, to our elements. Okay, so this is where we were at the beginning of this presentation with our uh, picture of the various elements that we had. We talked about agreements, we talked about consideration, we talked about legal capacity. Now we're ready for legal object. And here we are. We talked about the fact that it must have a legal subject, a legal exchanges its subject, it must be, be able to perform legally. And we also talked about how it couldn't violate a state statute. It can't, um, and, and we gave four examples of that. Uh, contracts for crimes or torts, contracts with non-licensed professionals, usurious contracts, and gambling and Sabbath or Blue Day law contracts. We also talked about contracts that violate public policy. For example, contracts in restraint of trade, such as covenants not to compete, and also unconscionable contracts, such as those that include an exculpatory clause. And then we also had the idea that the contract must be able to be performed legally. So those are the topics that we covered in the second half of chapter 11. Um, now we are going to conclude our lecture. So hopefully uh, this has been helpful for you in mastering the material in chapter 11. Uh, we have now completed the last um, element. We've covered the last element in the elements that are required for contract formation. Um, the, the, uh, the document that I just showed to you is available within um, uh, in its, in its final form, because we're, we're going to add something to it in Chapter 12, but you'll be able to see what we've done to date in the Chapter 12 module folder. I hope that's useful for you. Again, as always, if you have questions about the material, please uh, feel free to send me an email, come by my office hours, or raise those questions in class. I thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.